So how do we actually then um, estimate a single index model? Well, there's a sound argument to be made for actually taking the market portfolio as that single macroeconomic factor. Uh, remember, technically, it can be uh, other, other macro factors that uh, there's evidence for risky assets co-moving with. And you should really think of the single index model as a descriptive model, primarily. Um, it's just sort of based on this premise that seems to be borne out in the data that risky assets move with macroeconomic factors. Uh, but the market portfolio is a particularly uh, likely candidate for the single index model as the macro factor. And that sort of goes back to our idea from, uh, from portfolio theory. Remember, generally we assume that all investors are mean variance optimizers, and if so, they will all construct a risky portfolio on the efficient frontier. And remember, that actually means that they will own the same optimal risky portfolio uh, that gives you that highest sharp ratio slope of the capital allocation line, the capital market line, uh, given the same uh, set of risky assets and risk-free asset that all investors have access to. And if there's actually unlimited borrowing and lending at the risk-free rate, sort of consistent with portfolio theory, uh, then everybody's just going to fall somewhere along that capital market line, and they're going to hold some combination of the risk-free asset and that optimal risky asset, uh, which will therefore then be the market, right? Um, essentially, it'll be the asset that every or the portfolio that everybody holds. And well, if you add up the holdings of literally all the investors in an economy, uh, that must be the market portfolio because there's nothing else that remains once we account for all of the risky assets that all the investors hold. So if portfolio theory implies that all investors will choose the same risky portfolio, and really all that then matters is where they fall in making the decision of how to allocate their capital between the risk-free asset and this optimal risky portfolio. Then this takes us back to uh, this idea that there's a minimum variance frontier and a optimal capital market line that runs through it. Some investors will, uh, the maybe more, uh, or I should say less risk-averse ones, will find themselves borrowing at the risk-free rate and investing more than 100% of their wealth. Um, other more risk-averse ones might actually find themselves uh, putting part of their wealth into the risk-free asset. But at bottom, all of them will hold a certain optimal risky portfolio. And if they do, uh, then that optimal risky portfolio must be the market portfolio, simply because if we add up everybody's holdings of risky assets, well, uh, that must be the market. So that means that then uh, it sort of makes sense to use the optimal risky portfolio as that macro factor, uh, because it actually is going to be an asset that everybody holds if everybody follows portfolio theory. And uh, that is an asset then that is going to drive uh, the co-movements of any of the individual risky assets. So, uh, well, if it's the optimal portfolio of all risky assets, uh, what uh, must it actually be? Well, technically it's the sum of all investments of all types of assets available. Um, probably in just the financial market, uh, but we can even consider, you know, some real assets like, let's say, property, um, but definitely not just stocks, but bonds, uh, real estate, maybe commodities and metals, uh, you know, art, wine, um, anything that might theoretically be an investable asset should be part of it, uh, but that may be 
a bit overbroad. This is one uh, sort of discussion that uh, does come up, especially when we sort of more formally think about a capital asset pricing model, uh, what the market portfolio is. Um, but generally, if we think about it being the sum of all investor holdings in the economy, um, that'll sort of get us most of the way there. Now, how does this actually then relate to the single index model? Well, if everybody holds the same risky portfolio and the market portfolio is by definition the sort of the sum of everybody's holdings, well then that means those two things are equal, right? The risky portfolio that everybody holds must be the market portfolio. Uh, therefore, really everybody is exposed to the market portfolio. Um, it's therefore the most diversified portfolio because it's literally the uh, broadest portfolio you could create, so it has the smallest firm-specific risk uh, using this mathematical derivation of firm-specific variance of a portfolio that we showed just a little bit ago. And that means that everybody is going to essentially create their portfolios on a capital allocation line that connects the risk-free asset and the market portfolio, in other words, the capital market line. So what does uh, this actually mean then for asset pricing? Well, if everybody holds this market portfolio, then there should be no or as little as possible asset-specific risk. Let's say it's actually been completely diversified away. Um, that means that really the market portfolio represents systematic risk. Um, for all these investors. So how could we measure the risk contribution for an individual asset uh, in this market portfolio? Well, sort of here is where we get closer to this idea of, um, of risk and return. So if the market portfolio is optimally diversified, it's as big as a portfolio in this economy can get. Uh, in terms of just number of constituents, therefore that uh, denominator for the firm-specific or asset-specific risk uh, in the portfolio is as high as it can get, and therefore the asset-specific risk, um, defined as the average asset-specific risk divided by the number of assets, is as low as it can get. Well then essentially the contribution of any individual asset to systematic risk is just the co-movement of that individual asset with the market portfolio. Uh, because the firm-specific part doesn't really enter into it, uh, because the market portfolio is then just made up of systematic risk. Uh, so what do we mean by co-movement? Well, how do two assets move together? We know this from our discussion of modeling asset payoffs, uh, that's covariance. And if we then want to think about how do we measure sort of the risk-reward trade-off, well, we now know uh, sort of what the systematic risk for any individual asset is going to be. It's going to be this co-movement with the market portfolio. In other words, it's covariance. The uh, reward is, of course, going to be the expected return to that asset, uh, net of the risk-free rate. And therefore, essentially, what we're saying is that the risk-reward ratio is going to be, for any asset, the expected return, net of the risk-free rate, over the covariance between these two assets. Remember, the idea from the single fa factor or single index model is that expected return is proportional to sort of your beta or your co-movement, and it's proportional linearly. So essentially, then these ratios must be equal across all risk assets. So you can have different exposures or different degrees of co-movement with uh, the market portfolio, but they must be accompanied by sort of the same amount of 
proportional increase in expected return. Uh, so an asset that has greater co-movement should have a higher expected return. An asset that has lower co-movement should have lower expected return. Uh, but essentially the risk to reward ratio uh, for all stocks should be equal simply because of this idea that the only thing that's priced is the systematic risk. And the reason that is so is simply because the stuff that is not systematic, the firm-specific stuff, can be diversified away, right? Uh, we've shown that in a portfolio that gets larger and larger, the firm-specific variance gets smaller and smaller. So if you can avoid it, well, then it means that investors don't really need to seek a risk premium for it, and the market won't offer one, uh, because investors can actually avoid bearing that risk just by creating a diversified portfolio. So if the risk-reward ratio for all assets is proportional, well, it's going to be proportional for any individual asset, as well as the market portfolio, which is, after all, one of the assets uh, that an investor can hold. So the risk-reward ratio for the market portfolio, in other words, that optimal risky asset, remember, it falls somewhere on that capital allocation line, and uh, the capital allocation line sort of dictates what the risk-reward ratio is for any uh, combination of, uh, of assets. And any optimal portfolio then will have that same risk-return trade-off, so the covariance between any asset uh, and itself is, of course, just its variance. So we can actually say that this term here, the covariance of the market with the market, is just the variance of the market portfolio. So that means that for the market portfolio, we can actually write the risk-reward ratio like so. Uh, for all other assets, it is uh, still a ratio of the assets expected returns and the covariance with the market portfolio. But now if we update that idea that, all right, the risk-reward ratio must be uh, constant across all risk assets, the, uh, for the market asset, we can actually express the covariance as the variance instead. Well, what we can do is we can actually uh, multiply both sides of this equation by the covariance, effectively moving the covariance term from the denominator on the left side over to the numerator on the right side. thereby creating this equation. And if we term this ratio of covariance to variance uh, as beta, then this is the relation that we get. So uh, this is, by the way, sort of the connection to uh, regression that the slope of, uh, of a regression equation actually is the covariance of two, uh, of two variables over the variance of the second variable. Well, this means that the expected return to any risk asset, net of the risk-free rate, is the beta of that asset with respect to the market portfolio uh, times the expected return to the market portfolio net of the risk-free rate, and that then is the single index model uh, with the market index. But remember, we could have substituted any other macro index here for RM, and this model would work uh, similarly. But in this case, this is of course also the CAPM equation, uh, more on which So this is sort of how we actually show 
uh, that if everybody holds the market portfolio in various combinations with the risk-free rate, uh, then that actually leads us to a asset pricing equation where the expected return on any risky asset net of the risk-free rate is actually related to uh, that macro risk factor, the market portfolio's return, excess of the risk-free rate, uh, linearly. And the linear uh, factor is just the beta in term, in other words, the exposure of each individual risk asset to the market portfolio. And then, of course, I guess what this means is that the alpha, uh, remember for the single factor model, we had the idea that uh, the expected return on I should say the expected excess return on any risky asset is going to be alpha plus beta times the expected return on the Uh, index factor or the macro portfolio, in our case the index is going to be the market, well now we know that the alpha should actually be zero. And in a way this then allows us to um, diagnose what the uh, performance of a new risk asset is. Does it actually uh, underperform what the expected return should be? Is alpha less than zero? Or does it outperform what the expected return should be? Is alpha actually above zero? Or if it actually performs as expected, um, alpha indeed will be zero according to the single index model. So this is sort of its uh, power above what we can get from portfolio theory, um, is that it can actually let us create a model of expected returns at the individual asset level, and then we can actually measure the performance of individual risk assets relative to how much risk they take in terms of their exposure to the risky asset or to the single risk factor. Um, in this case, the market portfolio. And we can see if that exposure is rewarded proportionally or less than proportionally or more than proportionally uh, based on this intercept term. So if we think about this in terms of uh, essentially the CAPM, a single index model with the market portfolio as the macroeconomic factor, then the risk premium of any security is going to be explained by the exposure of that security to the market times the market risk premium. Um, and we can, of course, then move the risk-free term over to the right-hand side by adding the risk-free rate to both sides. Uh, then we can essentially say that the expected return on uh, any security, uh, not an excess return, but just the raw return, is going to be the risk-free rate plus the beta uh, times the market risk. So how do we actually uh, go about estimating this? Well, we need, first of all, a measure of the excess returns for our risk asset, and we need a measure of the excess returns for our market portfolio. So let's say that our market portfolio is going to be somewhat simpler than the grandiose uh, definition that we talked about, where it might be the portfolio of all risky assets that any in, that all investors hold in in sum. Um, that may be a bit too impractical, simply because we don't really know the returns to uh, all the works of art and all the rare wines and all of the other alternative assets in the economy at any particular time. Um, but we do know at least the returns to a portfolio of large risky firms. And that would of course be the S&P 500. So perhaps we can start there. 
uh, with the acknowledgement that this is not the full portfolio of all risky assets, uh, but we can think of it as essentially a proxy, uh, a second best. And we can compute the excess returns to the S&P 500 very easily, right? Because uh, we can observe the returns to the S&P 500 index. Um, we can subtract the risk-free rate. And let's say we want to fit the single index model to a specific firm like HP. Well, we can estimate the excess returns to HP by subtracting the risk-free rate as well. So if we actually plot the uh, sort of two-way scatter of combinations of excess return to HP and excess return to the S&P 500, uh, we do actually see that there's plausible uh, evidence for the S&P 500 being a good enough proxy for uh, the market portfolio. So the sort of line through the scatter plot would be called the security characteristic line, the SCL. And we do see that uh, the two seem to be positively related. When the excess return to HP on the y-axis is positive, well, the excess return to the S&P 500 is usually also positive. There aren't too many observations in either of these two off quadrants where one is positive, the other is negative. So there is a positive correlation or a positive covariance between HP and the market portfolio. Um, and that's sort of consistent, well, I should say with the S&P 500, but that's consistent with the S&P 500 being a plausible proxy for the market portfolio. Remember, of course, this is uh, a second best. It's not the market portfolio because technically the market portfolio uh, can be made up of a much larger uh, set of risk assets, both equities across the world as well as non-equity investable assets. Um, but again, sort of the single index model is a descriptive one. And evidence like this, that there is a often statistically significant uh, positive relation between the excess returns of individual equities and the S&P 500 portfolio, uh, that evidence suggests that the S&P 500 portfolio is a good enough proxy for the market portfolio. So with that assumption in place, if we feel now comfortable using the S&P 500 portfolio as our market proxy, we can actually go about estimating uh, the beta of, of HP. And remember, if you don't feel comfortable making that assumption, uh, you can always use other portfolios. You could use a larger portfolio of U.S. equities, maybe the Russell 3000. You could use a world portfolio or another country-specific portfolio if you are dealing with a uh, risk asset in another country. So in other words, we shouldn't be wedded to the idea that we must use the S&P 500 as our market portfolio proxy. But if we're looking at the case of HP specifically, uh, the evidence seems to be pretty uh, encouraging that we actually can get away with using the S&P 500 as the market portfolio proxy in this case. 